Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I know many people are still enjoying lunch, but uh, so that we can finish on time and have plenty of time for discussion today, I think we'll get going and just excuse the sound of the click click uh, of utensils. Welcome to the FCC. My name is Tara Joseph. I'm a journalist with Reuters and a convener of the professional committee this year at the club. Uh, just to let you know in advance, if you wouldn't mind putting your mobile phones to silent, uh, we are recording today's session. And also a few housekeeping notes on upcoming talks that we have at the club. Uh, later this week, uh, we have a session on Thailand and the fight for Thailand's democratic future. That is on the 26th. And then on July the 2nd, Anson Chan will be speaking at the club at lunch on the winding road to universal suffrage. And in July, we have a few more events coming up. We will have a debate uh, at the end of July with some uh, Hong Kong debaters and a few very brave members of the club uh, who volunteered to debate them. We also have some speed networking events coming up uh, over the summer. So now on to the event of the day, and do Hong Kong's laws protect journalists? Obviously a very good and important question, given uh, some of the harrowing experiences that journalists have had in Hong Kong this year, and some of the debates raging about freedom of the press in Hong Kong and in China as well. Many of you will be familiar with Doreen Weisenhaus, who is from the University of Hong Kong. She is both a journalist and a lawyer, and I would guess the city's expert on this topic. Uh, she worked for the New York Times. She was the first legal editor of the New York Times before coming over for a very quick stint to Hong Kong uh, to look into media law here. And over a decade later, she's now completed her second volume on Hong Kong media law. I think it took her three years to complete that. Obviously, a lot going on in terms of developments and changes. So I'd like to welcome Doreen, and I hope we have time for some question and answers after she tells us all the latest. Doreen. Thank you, Tara. I'm not sure we'll have time for all the latest. Um, when I started in 2001 uh, to, uh, or 2011 uh, to start doing some of the updates, I had no idea that 200 laws and regulations and cases later, um, I would have the new second edition out. Uh, so, um, but what I will try to do is some of the highlights. Okay. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you, Taro, for that introduction. And thank you to the Foreign Correspondents Club for having me here and to members and others who have come for what I hope will be an engaging, albeit short, conversation on an important topic. Um, I have had a career as a lawyer and as a journalist, but my last 15 years has been as an academic. We tend to talk too long. So feel free to cut me off if I go past my allotted 15 or 20 minutes. I may try to do that myself, but my students have experience with this. Okay, so let's start with a question. Now I know we have the question that's before us as to why I'm here, but I wanna start with a different question. I want you to look up at these images here. And what do a shelved anti-stalking proposal, an infamous white paper, and the arrest of a civil rights lawyer in China have in common? It's a rhetorical question. At first, they don't seem to be related. One seems purely local, a possible legislative bill uh, to be introduced in Hong Kong's legislative council that was dropped. One straddles, and some say crosses, the Hong Kong-China divide in a mostly political realm uh, with uncertain ramifications. And the other is something that happened on the mainland that while tragic and of great concern, does not seem on its surface to be particularly relevant to journalists and the media here. But to me, someone who lives, breathes, and dreams about media law, um, I try to look at all of these events and, and laws and legal developments through one prism only. And that is the impact on press freedom in Hong Kong. 
I do see connections, and I'll elaborate on those in a little bit about what I mean. But in the meantime, let's go back and focus on the question that brought me here today, a question that the FCC has asked me to address. How do Hong Kong's laws protect journalists? Why is this question being asked? Okay. Uh, it's because press freedom in Hong Kong has become a huge issue of concern, and to not just to people here, but to many international observers keenly watching what is happening here on the ground. Just recently in April, uh, at this very club, in this room, three esteemed journalists, Ching Chong, Shirley Lam, and Casey Chan, many of you know, spoke quite eloquently and in chilling detail about the very real political and economic pressures on today's Hong Kong media. Phone calls to media offices from mainland officials, millions of dollars in advertising that's pulled from publications that write critically of the government here and across the border um, are some of the stories that were told that day. People are all still stunned and reeling from a recent spate of violent attacks against journalists, including the life-threatening stabbing of Ming Pao editor Kevin Lau, who, thank goodness, is now on the mend on the road to recovery. And we've had a chance to visit him several times. So these concerns naturally bring us to the laws and whether they protect journalists and the media environment. Do they help journalists do their jobs? Do they promote press freedom? How do we answer these questions? Let's break it down. First of all, what does it mean to protect journalists? What are media laws? And not just one set spelled out, but many spread out over a broad spectrum. Some are quite clear, you're all familiar with. A lot of you working journalists, you know you're aware of defamation, you're aware of copyright, obscenity, privacy, broadcast regulations, and so on. But less clear are some of the other laws. And less clear is the impact of the absence of laws. Sometimes they can help and enhance, such as the fact here in Hong Kong, there is no pre-publication censorship, there's no licensing of journalists, and there are very few internet regulations outside of the traditional area of defamation, copyright, uh, and so on. But sometimes the absence of laws can hinder, such as the lack of freedom of information law, which greatly restrict how journalists can report on a secretive government. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are there laws and legal developments from outside Hong Kong that have an impact? Privacy Commissioner Alan Cheng wants the European Court of Justice's recent ruling on the right to be forgotten to be applied here. Can it be? There's no law here. There are no court cases. Should it be? Some interesting conversations I've been having in recent days uh, since this ruling came out. The biggest difference um, between political and economic pressures as contrast to the law is that the law is more transparent. It's there you can see its fingerprints in ways that you can't see political and economic pressures. You can see what laws are enacted by the Legislative Council, what are on the books, any decisions that are issued by the courts, whether in criminal cases or civil lawsuits, except for certain exceptions like um, guardianship of children, matrimonial cases. Um, but these must be made public, and that's based in the law. All right. Now, we could see more court access and transparency, uh, that's for sure. Uh, how many people are, have been going to the Rafael uh, Huey uh, trial, uh, the biggest corruption uh, case in decades here in Hong Kong? Uh, but they are the reporters who are working on covering um, the case up in the upper right hand corner of uh, Mr. Huey um, uh, say that it's a difficult uh, process indeed. Uh, there are so many lawyers in the courtroom that very few journalists can fit in, much less the public. Uh, the courtroom is jammed, and so the reporters are out in the hallway uh, working uh, off of a live feed um, and having some difficulties in doing the reporting, but doing the best that they can. Um, but what about the public? It's difficult for them. Some have argued, including Lord Dyson, who's head of role and the second highest justice on the UK Supreme Court, who visited us at the University of Hong Kong in October for a media law reform conference that 
we hosted uh, with the law faculty at Hong Kong U. Um, and he says that Hong Kong should go the way of the UK and the US and Canada and a few other jurisdictions that now allow cameras in the courtroom, that this would inspire confidence in the legal system. Uh, as we saw in South Africa in the Oscar Pistoria trial, um, there is cameras in the courtroom for a criminal case. So how do we go about making the analysis about the laws and their effectiveness? One way is to look at where we have been and where we are now. Then we look at where are we going? Where is that future? It's difficult to answer on the short term, uh, we have short time we have here. So I'm just going to give you a couple of nuggets, uh, and hopefully we can have time for Q&A in which you can explore questions that you might have um, for areas that you are interested in. Um, it's not an easy undertaking. I discovered when I first came here in 2000, as Tara mentioned, to teach media law. Uh, there were no uh, recent books, certainly none in English, and not after Hong Kong's handover to China after being a British colony um, for 150 years. So I ended up writing a book. It came out in 2007 for the 10th anniversary of the handover. Um, and so I was here last year at this podium at that time and gave a progress report. Some of which are continued on till today, uh, another seven years later. Some of them have tweaked and changed a bit. Uh, we still have the inherited colonial common law system that gave Hong Kong its independent legal infrastructure, its freewheeling capitalism that nurtured a healthy media market, um, and also, most important, are the legal guarantees for freedom of expression in the Basic Law and the Bill of Rights. Danny Giddings, a colleague of mine at Hong Kong U, has written an excellent book on the introduction to the basic law. If anyone wants to find out more about um, what this underpinning is for the basic law and the Bill of Rights, because what's critical at that time is that it was based on the human rights and constitutional principles. Um, and this was really important, because before the handover, under the old British system at the time, UK law was definitely applied in Hong Kong, but now we have a human rights and constitutional component based on international standards. And how does that play out? We have the basic uh, law, Article 27, that guarantees uh, Hong Kong has freedom of speech of the press and publication. We have Article 39 of the basic law that mandates that provisions of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, a 1966 United Nations Treaty based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights remain part of Hong Kong. And the Bill of Rights Ordinance, enacted in 1991, I know some of you were here at this time, you may have come right after or right around that time, um, which incorporated verbatim uh, numerous articles of the ICCPR. Why? Oh, thank you. Um, because uh, it was um, very soon after Tiananmen. Um, and so there was a fear um, that there needed to be this type of um, uh, protections. So indeed, that was enacted and eventually uh, became law again after the handover. Now, um, judges, Hong Kong judges, um, uh, uh, no longer have to automatically apply uh, British common law to issues that arise. They still often do, but they also draw from other jurisdictions as well as fashion their own interpretation, looking to Hong Kong's constitution, its basic law. So in the new book, I talk about their, uh, looking at analysis of how the Court of Final Appeal did, um, specifically looking at constitutional right cases. Um, and Simon Young at the Faculty of Law um, wrote a very interesting book that analyzed from 1999 to 2009 um, these cases. And what they do, they document a, quote, robust liberal and mainstream approach to protecting fundamental rights. Uh, this includes um, uh, decisions on presumption of innocence, legal certainty, and protection against arbitrary uh, imprisonment, freedom to travel, freedom of expression, and freedom of assembly. So that part of the system worked. Hong Kong's unique arrangement that allows judges from other common law jurisdictions to serve on the Court of Final Appeal ensure an international perspective and influence in shaping its jurisprudence. Many decisions, including a media law decision on defamation in 2000, on fair comment, uh, remain a model for other jurisdictions. But we did, after all, inherit British rule, uh, which means that we were bequeathed, still in evidence today, a legacy of harsh laws regarding defamation, official secrets, sedition, reporting on court proceedings, and so forth. 
that make it hard and sometimes risky for journalists to do their jobs here. And with the handover, there was a missed opportunity in Hong Kong. We had a missed opportunity to pass a freedom of information law. More than 90 countries today have a freedom of information law. And if you do a survey of how these laws came into, into passing, it seems like it would be difficult because it's against politicians' best interests. You're saying that journalists have a right that's enforced by law to investigate what the government is doing. However, many of these FOIA laws pass just before or just after political transitions. Canada's 1982 law passed under the Liberal Party just before a predicted landslide by the Conservative Party. The UK had some similar um, uh, political shift that allowed freedom of information law uh, to be passed. It took a while for it to be enacted, five years, some say to give the government time to clean up its house, um, but we'll give them the benefit of the doubt. So in 1995, uh, when the then governor of Hong Kong had this opportunity uh, to pass a freedom of information law, uh, Christine Lowe, uh, then a legis uh, legislator, uh, tried to uh, introduce a um, member's bill. Uh, it instead uh, ignored that and instituted the now weak administrative code. It's a shame because Hong Kong is behind not only um, uh, Western countries, uh, and it certainly is the, the only developed country that doesn't have a freedom of information law, but it's also um, uh, behind Thailand, South Korea, Japan, Pakistan, India, Taiwan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Mongolia, and yes, even the PRC. So. Um, uh, it's a shame because um, there are many who feel, and this is a topic for a whole nother conversation uh, about what a freedom of information law can do. Uh, clearly, not only uh, enhances a journalist's um, uh, um, uh, ability uh, to report, but also enables individuals and companies because they find that the vast majority of people who use a freedom of information law are indeed non-journalists. Um, they also include a lot of businesses. Uh, it's a great business incentive because it opens up financial, statistic, contractual, and other information on what governments uh, do and who they do business with, and um, that could make that particular jurisdiction a more competitive business environment. However, despite having uh, given us uh, these draconian laws, the UK has moved on. Uh, in recent years, it has instituted legal reforms to enhance freedom of expression uh, for many aspects of media law, including with new legislation for defamation, a Freedom of Information Act, as I mentioned, the repeal of sedition laws, criminal libel offenses, and scandalizing the court, uh, all of which still exist here in Hong Kong. So it makes it harder for in its criminal defamation um, uh, new law uh, for parties to sue, it strengthens available defenses, and it's expected to end the UK's reputation as libel capital of the world. Interesting, because Hong Kong still has um, these harsher criminal laws. There are some who predict that as time goes on, Hong Kong might become the new libel capital of the world. So we have something to look forward to. So what does this mean? It means that Hong Kong has remained mostly frozen in time with many antiquated media laws inherited from another era. So while Britain and other countries have moved on while Hong Kong lags behind in providing adequate legislative protection for freedom of expression in the press, what can Hong Kong do? Can it be entrusted to enact legislation, particularly in these politically decisive, divisive times? It did in 2012, the summer of, it passed an amendment to the Data Privacy Protection Act. Um, there are many who felt that that offered some worrying aspects for the media because it introduced a criminal offense to publish private information without the consent of individuals if it can cause psychological harm, but did not define what psychological harm was. They did give up on anti-stalking uh, legislation recently, um, as they did in 20, uh, 2003 for Article uh, 23. But they are going ahead with the copyright digital reforms. Um, and again, uh, that is a very interesting uh, topic of conversation. Um, it definitely has some interesting elements to it. The new bill uh, uh, aims to introduce fair dealing exceptions for parody, satire, 
caricature, quotation, and comment on current events. It's different from the current law, which only allows for criticism and several other exemptions. Now, while this bill is better than what is currently on the books, um, there's a lot of disappointment and concern, particularly among those um, who are very interested in what happens uh, to the internet uh, and internet users. They're quite disappointed in large part because the government declined to introduce a broad exception for non-commercial, non-profit, user-generated content. So something that goes beyond the media, but it's something that supplements the uh, dissemination of information uh, to the public and certainly enhances freedom of expression. And this was despite the fact that more than 90% of the submissions favored uh, this option. How am I doing on time? Yikes. OK. I'll talk really fast. All right. So I do want to go back to, OK, so here's the British rules. OK, on to freedom of information. OK. I do want to talk about um, this uh, mainland lawyer, uh, Pu Zhejiang. He's a prominent civil rights lawyer in Beijing, well-known internationally, and certainly well-known uh, in mainland China. Um, uh, JMSC uh, just launched uh, a website uh, yesterday um, that gives a lot of details and background about his case and why we should care about him. Um, he, he was an advocate for uh, protecting free speech in China and played a large hand in the kinds of cases that he took that helped to abolish labor camps in China, which were often used to put in people um, who had political speech um, that was not wanted. Um, he, however, considered himself to be a moderate, working within the legal system to defend the rights of individuals and bring about change in a native country that he felt very passionate about. On June 13th, he was formally arrested for creating a public disturbance, something in connection uh, to attending a private seminar uh, that was in the days up before the 25th anniversary of the Tiananmen crackdown. Um, and others aren't quite sure that it might go beyond that, but certainly he was arrested right after that. But it's for the second offense that I draw your attention to that has also been raising alarms, and that hasn't been getting as much focus. And that is the second offense of illegally obtaining the personal information of others. Now, it's an interesting thing. We, um, it's an offense that is a fairly recent one. It's based on Article 253 of the criminal law in uh, mainland China. And in the past, before this amendment, it dealt with postal workers or other government employees who opened up mail, who stole things um, and hid them or destroyed them and so on. But as China became, became more concerned over the use of personal data, particularly online, it was looking to build up a more robust online marketplace, um, the offense was amended. And it added this part that prohibited the illegal sale and unlawful disclosure of individual personal data by government and private employees in various sectors and industry, usually medical, financial, and so on, who had access to the data. And since 2009, the Chinese authorities have prosecuted many of these cases against violators, usually involving consumer information, subscriber telephone lists, and so on. However, um, there's been something interesting going on here. And what we don't know, the underlying facts of this charge, is that some speculate that it might have involved um, who having access to company shareholder information. Um, and there has been uh, at least uh, one or two um, uh, uh, very public prosecutions. We remember uh, Peter Humphrey, uh, the corporate investigator, the former journalist uh, who was paraded on CCTV, um, who confessed uh, to obtaining um, a, a personal information, personal data, um, and was given um, uh, a lengthy uh, time uh, in detention. Um, and so at that time, we began to worry about how this law, which looks like other personal data laws in other countries, might ensnare journalists. And it's something that you need to kind of focus on and worry about if you are reporting on the mainland. Um, because many of the greatest stories that have been coming out in recent uh, months and weeks have been stories about what? The assets of uh, Chinese leaders, their families, uh, various companies, and so on. Uh, so a red flag for that as well. Um, okay, quickly for the white paper. Okay, all right, no. Okay, hold on. Uh, let me go back here. All right. Okay, okay. Um, 
There was much backlash uh, on this unprecedented white paper issued earlier this month, which stated uh, Beijing's uh, relationship with Hong Kong, that the central government uh, has uh, comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong and is the source of Hong Kong's autonomy. One aspect in particular troubled many here, that the central authorities considered the judiciary as ad administrators who held a basic political requirement to love the country. As mentioned earlier, one of the great strengths of Hong Kong is its independent judiciary, and certainly it has been a friend of press freedom. Time and time again, um, my analysis of uh, media law cases over the last 20 years have shown at least a dozen major decisions in which the court have ruled favorably for the press um, and for free speech, whether they're expanding on the right to comment on a matter of public interest, accepting the public interest defense for responsible journalism, or upholding the right to take news photographs on the street. As the honorary Bokhari said to the Hong Kong Journalists Association in 2012, before he retired from as permanent judge on the Court of Final Appeal, how do I reconcile a controlled media with a free one? Quite simply, I do not. They are irreconcilable. A controlled media is not a free one. Between the media and the judiciary, there is great similarity, especially in Hong Kong. Free speech is the lifeblood of the media, and judiciary independence is the lifeblood of the judiciary. And he goes on to talk about how this relationship is where the media needs to cover uh, the judiciary and the judiciary needs to protect uh, press freedom. Now, particularly because of economic and political pressures, including from the mainland, uh, there are many media owners and managers who face accept willingly or unwillingly um, this idea of um, uh, self-censorship, for lack of a better phrase. Um, and so how do the media deal with this? Um, so my um, observation on this, that if efforts are made to stem this kind of lifeblood of reporting, um, the greatest defense against them actually may be the journalists themselves and their ability to raise public consciousness where press freedom uh, is threatened. They have demonstrated this many times in recent uh, years through protest marches, signature and advertising campaigns, education efforts of their professional organizations. These efforts have worked and they may have to work again. So how do I answer the question we had at the beginning? Uh, do Hong Kong's laws protect journalists? Well, spoken like a true lawyer, some do and some don't. Um, but there is an underlying foundation for press freedom that does exist here in Hong Kong. However, it must be vigilantly guarded and protected, including from journalists themselves. Thank you. Doreen, thanks very much. If you want to stay up there for Q&A, maybe a bit easier. We have time for questions and answers. There's microphones if you want to raise your hand. Uh, give us your name and organization if you're with one. Uh, who'd like to go first? Um, Florence. Yes. Thank you, Florence de Changer with, uh, with Le Monde. Um, could you give us a little bit more details about what happened in 95 when you said Christine Law was about to put a press of information law? Is that correct? And then um, also if you could uh, explain um, uh, simply uh, to non-lawyers, what would we get? Because in a way, it's very good to have a very uh, vague uh, freedom of expression law, as explained in the basic uh, mm -hmm. law, I, I guess, because it's wide. And if we did get a more specific press of information law, where well, maybe we would know more precisely where it goes. I mean, uh, is that much to gain in having a more precise law, basically? Thanks. Um, I'll give you the background, um, but let me give you the uh, headline first. Uh, and the headline is what you would get is the opportunity to use the courts to enforce any denial of information requests. So you don't have that now. So in 1995, Christine Lowe, knowing that we're about to have this handover, wanted to make sure that a freedom of information law exists. And that really is the major advantage, that it's not just relying on the government and saying, OK, can you hand me this information? And they have all these rules that say, yes, we hand it over in this and this and this. But then if they don't, what is your recourse? And the recourse is the courts. And that has been a very effective um, uh, uh, checks and balance against a government that doesn't want to release information. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Neil? 
Sorry. Yeah, and um, there's been uh, some recent cases of journalists and publishers from Hong Kong who have been um, arrested on the mainland for work they've done whilst in Hong Kong. Um, do you ever see that reach coming over the border to affect people working in Hong Kong? Um, and what is your advice to journalists who do, that, do sensitive work here as regards travel to the mainland? <laughs> um, I've had conversations with a number of editors over the years about this. Um, and some of it is um, very clever these days of um, they're not being arrested necessarily for state secrets. The cases that you're alluding to are publishers here in Hong Kong who have published uh, critical um, uh, profiles of Chinese leaders, other uh, uh, critical uh, books, and then they've gone over uh, to mainland China and they have been arrested for things that are not about that. And that is what happens quite frequently. So uh, one of the publishers um, was arrested for carrying an illegal item. Um, apparently, he brought over some kind of paint or some other kind of equipment or something. And it wasn't what declared. And so they got him on this illegal um, uh, contraband that he brought over. But it was not tied to what he did. Um, in the past, when there was a lot of concern about state secrets, um, there were a number of editors who advised um, their reporters, if you go to the mainland and someone says, I have a document for you, do not touch it. Do not put it in your hand. Do not grab it. Do not be in possession of it, because um, that uh, can frequently be a ruse to get you to have in your possession uh, a state secret. Uh, so you have to kind of think about, you know, what are your defense mechanisms? I could do a whole nother talk about reporting on the mainland from China, uh, from Hong Kong and doing that, and um, maybe I can uh, come back another time and do that. But um, that certainly is a concern, and you have to be proactive in how to protect yourself. Over here. Terrific talk. Terrific talk, Tareen. Thank you, Robin. Robin Meredith from Reorient. Um, if we saw, if we were to see some civic disturbances in the coming days, as you know, is there anything besides self-censorship that we should worry about? The journalists should worry about in Hong Kong. In, in terms of, is there, is there anything explicitly that could get the journalist in trouble, um, particularly in light of this white paper that's come out? Because there's some ambiguity in what press freedom means. Well, I mean, I don't see in the summer of 2014 uh, central authorities coming into, and I guess that follows up on your question, coming into um, Hong Kong and making arrests of journalists here. Um, I do think there has been um, not just what's been happening in the last few weeks, but a ratcheting up of a harsher line between the government, the local Hong Kong government and Hong Kong journalists over the last several years, actually. And there's been more clashes and more willingness uh, to arrest journalists or to detain them or to somehow kind of control them, put them off in you know protest areas that are not uh, tied to where the events are that you want to go to. And there certainly is that. My advice uh, is to don't get into a tussle with a, poli uh, with a police officer. Um, they have been quite creative in some of the charges. Um, there was um, uh, one person who um, uh, opened up a bottle of champagne on the day that Lu Jibao won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize and accidentally splashed it on a police officer and was arrested, but the charges dropped for assaulting a police officer because they got champagne in the guy's eye. Anyway, there. I'm not saying that, I mean, that's an extreme example, but you just have to kind of be aware of um, the situation around you, try to do your job as assertive and aggressively as possible. But there will be sweeps, and there will be people, particularly if there's violence, um, that has certainly, um, nonviolence has been a hallmark of these large um, protests in Hong Kong. That doesn't seem to be the case now, although certainly there's absolute hope that July 1 uh, will um, continue with the peaceful march. Uh, so we'll see. On that note, Doreen, do you see the white paper uh, as a watershed moment and that we will actually really start to see a very obvious decline in press freedom? I don't see it necessarily as a direct connection, A, straight line to B, but it certainly has been a watershed moment that seems to be central authorities are taking the gloves off. 
Um, a number of us did think that at the end of the 50 years, we might see some action this way. I've gotten into many arguments over the years with members of the law faculty, say, oh, nothing's going to change. Um, maybe there would, and what's to hold China back, and so forth. Um, but uh, that said, still looking at the document, there is nothing specific in that that says we will take away this, we will take away that, and so forth. It's just kind of the tone, and it might set into play things that are non-legal um, to start out with and see where that plays out. More questions from the floor? Let's start over here. Hello, I'm a reporter from Now TV. Yes, I, I, I've noticed that uh, some news has said the government is putting pressure to some international corporates for not putting advertisement on certain newspapers. And do you think there is any way for those publishers to protect themselves or they can do nothing against the pressure from the government? Because that actually, that is killing the income of those uh, newspapers or magazines and it, it actually erodes the press freedom in Hong Kong. You know, that's a very interesting question because clearly that's part of the economic pressures. But it is, again, as I said earlier, it's an action with no fingerprints, right? You can't quite trace it to an actual conversation or a directive or an order and so forth. You have uh, a major uh, a company, uh, in this case with Apple Daily, involving some very um, you know, large you know, banking institutions. Uh, we say, oh, it's just business. It's just business, you know, and that's the way it is. And it's hard to fight against that. It's hard to prove that that is really with the instigation behind it. It's a di it's a difficult situation. Doreen Gavin McDougall. Oh, nice to see nice you. Nice to see you as well. Former journalist now with the Australian Consulate General. You mentioned um, in your speech about the archaic British laws that yes. pose that that you consider pose a significant threat in that Hong Kong could in future become the libel capital of the world. Mm -hmm. um, if that is the case, why has that not already happened and why do you now see a threat that that will happen? It hasn't happened because the new legislation uh, in the UK hasn't really fully taken effect yet. It just went uh, into effect in January of this year. Um, but there are a lot of uh, cases that are still on the books from prior, and those will take several years to get down the road. So it could be something that happens further down. Um, so in my sense um, of looking at the situation, there are still a lot of cases that are pending in the UK. Why do I say it might happen in Hong Kong? Believe me, it's not the only place. There are a couple other places that say, oh, it might happen in, um, in Canada. It might happen in other places. But Hong Kong still has probably the most favorable plaintiff-friendly laws still around uh, compared to the other common law jurisdictions. And I'm talking about the court cases. And then it has a defamation ordinance that was from the 19th century. Literally, um, and so it's had a few amendments and updates since then, but certainly nothing modern and certainly nothing that takes into account the internet. Now, that said, uh, the courts have been um, uh, quite good in several key cases in the past two years of trying to hold down. Uh, in one case, uh, they were able to, um, uh, 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 you know, hold down on uh, damages um, and set out some new rules so that kind of limit it and capped it. In other words, take away some of the incentive. Uh, for uh, plaintiffs to come here. And in a second um, uh, a couple of cases, um, they um, uh, offered up some protection for internet service providers um, so that they would not have the same liability that they had prior to these court decisions. So maybe I'm wrong. I would love to be, um, although it's, you know, addition three for Hong Kong media law. Um, but we'll have to see. Um, but it's a little bit uh, premature yet from what's happening uh, in the UK. But thank you, Gavin, for that question. Over here. Thanks. Uh, Nick Edwards from the South China Morning Post. You mentioned a defamation ruling um, in 2000. Can you explain what was significant about that and what makes it a model? Uh, it was amazing. Um, Albert Chang, we all know who he is, um, uh, radio talk show host, uh, LegCo member, you know, 
almost radio station owner. Um, and he um, was involved uh, in a defamation action where he was sued um, by a lawyer uh, for comments that he made when he was doing the radio program. Um, and he lost uh, at the trial level, um, and he was arguing that uh, what he was talking about uh, was uh, something that was quite interesting and in the public interest. Uh, it involved uh, someone from Hong Kong who had been arrested uh, and charged with uh, drug violations in the Philippines, and Albert was talking about the uh, rescue efforts, and the lawyer who sued him thought that he had besmirched to his reputation um, because he was a lawyer who was working on behalf of the travel agency. This was a tour guide um, who was uh, arrested uh, and charged uh, in the Philippines. So, but Albert had, and this is a very, very good point to end on, and I'm really glad, uh, Neil, you brought this question. Albert had something that a lot of media defendants don't have. He had deep pockets. He lost on the trial level. He lost on the Court of Appeal, and he didn't want to give up. He was very stubborn. Um, and he took it up to the Court of Final Appeal. And the Court of Final Appeal is a pretty good one when you look at its decisions, as I talked about earlier, in terms of protecting press freedom and freedom of expression, and that's where he won. But it cost him 10 million Hong Kong dollars to get there. Now, when you win at the top, then the loser pays your fees and so forth, but you don't know you're going to win. And that is something that I think a lot of the media companies really have trouble with because they may lose a case and we, you know, encourage them, appeal, appeal, you're going to win, you're going to win. It's like, ugh, what if I don't? Um, but some do. Ming Bao, for example, um, uh, had a, um, a, a defamation um, a jury go against them um, with an editorial that they wrote about a soccer um, corruption case. And in that case, um, uh, they feel that, you know, they had justification for writing in their editorial what they did. And they lost. Um, uh, and the jury awarded uh, 500,000 Hong Kong dollars against them. They're appealing that case. I was just talking to Kevin about that the other day, and he was like, yeah, go, go for it. Um, so that's how law is made. Because if you're not going to have um, uh, new laws that are passed, if there isn't that political gut to go in and, and bring those cases, and maybe we don't want them, the courts can do that. And But you need strong plaintiffs um, who can, or excuse me, strong defendants uh, who can bring that through and bring about the legal reform, at least through the courts. We're just about to go on to two o'clock, so I think we'll leave it there on such a wide topic. Thank you very much for giving us a bit of a taster of all the things we need to think about. Um, I hope we can bring you back to, to talk to some more working journalists soon about what they need to think about. Doreen, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.